Good evening. Good morning. This is Dr. Bennett, broadcasting from Miami. Today we have another uh, another conference in the uh, overall conference for pediatric neurosurgery. Uh, neurosurgery TV is collaborating with the neurosurgical department of the A double uh, I uh, uh, MC of New Delhi. And today we have the pleasure of having uh, Natarahan uh, Mathu Kumar, uh, MD, is a neurosurgeon from India. He's going to talk about spinal lymphomas. I'm sorry we're a little late, uh, but uh, away you go. It's all yours. Uh, good evening, John. It has been like a great uh, two days of uh, online conference. And uh, my wishes to all of you. Thanks for this opportunity. Uh, let me start the screen sharing. Okay. okay. Uh, are you able to see, see my presentation? I'll let you know when you see it. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, 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 we can see it. Yes, we can see it. Yes, we can see it. Very good. So, in this presentation, I am going to summarize my experience with spinal lipomas where I am trying to present a, propose a new classification, a part of which has been already published some seven years ago. And I am going to tell you the practical implications of this particular classification. Now, why a new classification for spinal lipomas is required? Because, in my opinion, the terms lipomyelomeningocele and lumbosacral lipomas are probably one of the most misused terms in neurosurgery. Because spinal lipomas represent a spectrum of malformations. At one end of the spectrum lies the filar lipoma, where the surgery is relatively straightforward and the long, long term outcome is extremely good. Whereas on the other end is the transitional lipomas and chaotic lipomas, where the, the outcome is uh, less than optimal. When we lump together all these lipomatous malformations as a single entity by using a term such as lipomyelomeningocele or lumbosacral lipoma, we end up uh, failing to differentiate the different malformations, which in turn leads to inaccurate assumptions regarding the prognosis and eventually to inappropriate management. Before we proceed to the new classification, we should have a brief overview of what are the previous classifications that have been proposed and why, how this new classification is different from them. The first classification of spinal lipomas was proposed by Paul Chapman in 1982, who classified spinal lipomas into caudal, dorsal, and transitional. Barry French uh, classified them as lipomyelomeningocils and lumbosacral lipomas. Hoffman also classified them as lipomyelomeningocils and lumbosacral lipomas. Kallenberg and colleagues classified them as lipomyelostasis and lipomas of the corners. Perigan from Paris used the term lumbosacral lipomas. He divided them into lipomas of the phylum and corners lipomas. He also introduced two specific terms, lipomyeloseals and lipomyelomeningoseals, for which he provided the definitions. Lipomyeloseal, when the cord herniated extra spinally to end in a subcutaneous lipoma, and lipomyelomeningoseal, when the subcutaneous lipoma was associated with the meningoseal. A part of this particular definition we have adopted as far as lipomyelomeningoseal and lipomyeloseal is concerned. Macomb used the term closed neural tube with lipomatous malformation and Tortari Donati from Italy used the term lipomyelomeningocele and lipomyeloskysis. Now, the Vancouver group used the term symmetrical lipomyelomeningocele when the lipoma placode interface was bilaterally symmetrical and asymmetrical lipomyelomeningocele when the lipoma placard interface is asymmetrically rotated to one side. Now, even in a recent publication, for example, this month's publication in the Journal of Neurosurgery, a wonderful article was published, which, which uses a, a, a gross term like a lumbosacral lipoma. Now, the terminology we are proposing is a congenital spinal lipomatous malformation. Why is it so? Each word has got some significance. Congenital to differentiate from spinal epidural lipomatosis, which is an accurate condition, which generally occurs occurs in patients who are on long-term long steroid therapy, which can sometimes become symptomatic. Why spinal? 
to differentiate from intracranial lipomas, which are often incidental findings on imaging. For example, a colossal lipoma is usually an incidental finding on imaging. Why do you use the term lipomatous malformation? Because an excellent study, a large series of 200 patients by Perry Khan from Paris, where every part of the lipomatous lipoma was subject to the histopathology, they found that, that over 77% of lesions have derivatives of all three gem layers. Therefore, it is defective morphogenesis and not neoplasia. So when you use the term lipoma, it automatically connotes a neoplasia, whereas it is the malformation due to a defective embryogenesis. And that is the reason why we propose the term congenital spinal lipomatous malformation. What is the purpose of classifying a disease? The purpose of classifying any disease is to differentiate the different subtypes of a disease by their origin, by their pathology, by the clinical concentration, by the treatment and prognosis. Preferably, a classification should satisfy all these criteria, if not at least some of these criteria. We published our uh, classification of spinal lipomatous malformation as a two-part article in March issue of Acta Neurochirurgica in 2009. At that time, we had 80 patients. Now uh, we have added 64 more patients in this presentation. Now, what should an ideal classification system possess? An ideal classification should system should take into consideration the anatomical features of the lesion so as to provide a logical and organized approach to its management. There should be clear description of the radiological and surgical findings of each subtype, that which is mandatory for meaningful comparisons between different studies. Now, the aim of this presentation and our publication is to propose a new classification which is based on the clinical presentation, the operative find findings, the complications and outcome, and eventually the embryology. And we, over a 20-year period, we had the opportunity to study 144 patients ranging in age from 18 days to 19 years. And we used Hoffman's, Harold Hoffman's functional grading published in 1985. There are many gradings for assessing patients with spinal dysrhythm, but in my practice over the past several a couple of decades, I have found that Hoffman's grading is a clinically easy way to assess patients in the outpatient settings. All patients underwent, of course, MRI, and in the, for all those patients who were imaged in our institution, we, so we are specific in doing 3D cis images, which are, uh, as we, are, we do 3D cis images for all our patients with spinal disruption because we found it to be extremely useful in delineating the pathological anatomy. The follow-up range from six months to ten years. Now, this is the classification we are proposing. The class the lipomas are grossly divided into two groups: lipomas without dural defect and lipomas with dural defect. In the first group, lipomas without dural defect, there are three subtypes: caudal lipomas, filar lipomas, intramedullary lipomas. In the second group, lipomas with dural defect, we have dorsal lipomas. Once again, we have caudal lipomas with dural defect. The difference between these two caudal lipomas, I will you will see later in the course of the discussion. And the third type is transitional lipoma. Fourth is lipomyelomeningosal, and fifth is lipomyelosal. In the second subgroup, in the group, there are five subtypes. If you notice, the first three are colored differently. This is because in the first three subtypes, dorsal lipomas, caudal lipomas with dural defect, and transitional lipomas, the lipoma cord interface lies within the spinal canal. In fact, there is no herniation of the neural tissue outside the spinal canal. Whereas in the last two subtypes, lipomyelomeningosins and lipomyelosin, the neural elements herniate outside the spinal canal and the lipoma cord interface lies outside the spinal canal. As we shall be seeing during the course of this discussion, these two subgroups differ from one another in their embryology, in the clinical presentation, in the surgical findings and eventually the prognosis. Now, in the first group, lipomas without dural defect, during the past 20 years, we had 40 patients, and the most common was filar lipoma, which was 27 in number, followed by caudal lipoma. There was only one case of intramedullary lipoma. Now, what are the class clinical presentations? What are the differences in clinical presentation between these two subgroups, lipomas without dural defect and lipomas with dural defect? In the first groups, lipomas without dural defect, there's a very low percentage of cutaneous markers are present only in 40%. And when they are present, they are often 
hairy patches, dorsal appendages, etc. And subcutaneous mass is rare and gross orthopedic anomalies such as congenital talibus equinoides or such foot abnormalities are rare in this subgroup which are in fact common in the other group. And most of the patients presented more than five years of age. And interestingly, whenever a patient was found less than, when diagnosed less than two years of age, they are better preserved neurologically. To just recap Hoffman's classification, grade zero means a uh, well-preserved patient, whereas a grade five patient is one who is uh, wheelchair bound. So whenever a patient in group one was found to be in less than two years of age, they were better preserved neurologically. And surprisingly, nearly one third of these patients were asymptomatic. And these are some of the cutaneous markers which brought these patients to medical attention. Now let's first see the first subtype of lipomas without dural defect. This is a cardinal lipoma without dural defect. Notice there is no, there is no subcutaneous swelling, there is no defect in the bone as such and the lipoma is sacral in location and the cord has extended right all the way up to this sacral, uh, sacral uh, region where the lipoma is adherent. The lipoma does not penetrate the dura mater because there is no subcutaneous mass and the nerve roots do not pass through the lipoma and there is no phylum terminate and a, these lipomas are often associated with sacral agnesis otherwise known as caudal regression syndrome. And this is the intraoperative photograph of this particular patient whose image we saw in the previous slide. Notice the, the sacral location of the lipoma and the horizontal course of the nerve roots prior to sectioning. And at the excision of the lipoma, notice the ascent of the conus, upward migration of the cord, as well as the nerve roots resuming their normal course. Another example of a patient with a caudal regression syndrome with type 4 C sacral agenesis who had a caudal lipoma. There's a fusiform lipoma that is adherent to the caudal end of the aspect of the conus medullaris. There is no subcutaneous mass and the nerve roots do not pass through the lipoma. What is important to note is, interestingly, in this particular subgroup, motor deficits when present are minimal, whereas urological symptoms are extremely common. And there's a high association with caudal regression syndrome. Nearly two thirds of patients with caudal lipoma without neural defect will have caudal regression syndrome. And this is the interoperative photograph of the same patient shown in the previous slide, which shows the, the lipoma in the sacral location and the cord being tethered right at the sacral region. And uh, notice the lipoma has been detached from its distal attachment. Notice the absence of the phylum, which is one of the characteristic features of a caudal lipoma without dural defect. And the lipoma has now been detached from the distal attachment, but is still attached to the conus medullaris from which it has been excised. Now, this is another example of a caudal lipoma without dural defect. There are all the three images. This is pre, pre, after opening the dura, the, the cord is stretched right up to that and the lipoma is adherent to the conus medullaris. This is following a total excision of the lipoma. This is following neurulating of neurulation of the conus medullaris. Now this is a phylar lipoma, we use the term phylar lipoma when there is fatty infiltration of the phylum. The amount of fat in the phylum may vary from very small to large amount. In fact, this is one of the largest phylar lipomas I have encountered with a large amount of fat. And this is, this is another example where a, the amount of fat in the phylum is sort of moderate. And this is one where there's a fairly thin, almost the size, size of the uh, penfield dissector. Now, intramedullary lipomas are included for uh, completion purposes. Only one such case was uh, encoded in the entire series. This is a clinical for, uh, intraoperative photograph of the same patient. Now, what about the surgery? How, how, how do this, this particular group of lipomas without dural defect differ from lipomas with dural defect? It is interesting to note that in this particular group, the surgery is straightforward. The, there is no dural defect. Yes, once we open the dura, it, the one has to section the, uh, the lipomatous phylum in phylum lipomas. And in caudal lipomas, one has to identify the, the conus lipoma border and excise the lipoma and neurolite the cord. Debulking alone is recommended in intramedullary lipomas. It is in our series, one, uh, the, uh, 
the primary neural closure was possible without need for grafting uh, in all the cases because there is no neural defect and the C incidence of CSF leak is extremely low in this particular group and there are no wound complications like flap necrosis. Now the outcome, as far as the outcome in this particular group is concerned, all asymptomatic patients remained asymptomatic during follow-up. Other patients improved at least by one Hoffman grade, if not more, and greatest improvement in sphincter disturbances. Whenever a patient with sphincter disturbances improved in their bladder control, bowel control, that occurred only in this group. And during the follow-up, which ranged up to 10 years, there was no retelling was noted and no patient fortunately deteriorated following surgery. Now let's come to the next group, lipomas with neural defect, which is a much more common entity, where which is a much more complex entity also. Here we had 104 patients, most common being a lipomyelomeningocyte, the other being transitional lipomas, cardinal lipomas, dorsal lipomas, and li lipomyrosis numbers of which are given here. Now, the interesting point to you note know, is clinically, all the, the second group, all the patients will have some sort of a cutaneous marker, which is present in 100%, and neurological deficits are fairly common. Asymptomatic patients are rare in this particular group, and the most common group will be motor disturbances, sphincter disturbances, limb, limb length discrepancies, and orthopedic anomalies such as foot deformities or common and because these patients have cutaneous markers like subcutaneous masses, these patients come to neurosurgical attention much earlier than the previous group. But whenever this the presentation was delayed, the older children had more severe neurological deficits. This, these are some of the examples. The size of the lipoma can vary from small to medium to extremely large as shown here. Now this is the first type, we have a subtype of lipoma with neural defect we are going to discuss. This is dorsal lipoma. The cla classical feature of a dorsal lipoma is an extra thecal lipoma which penetrates through a defect, bony defect and neural defect and is adherent to the dorsal aspect of the cord. And the most important point to notice is there is normal cord distal to the lipoma conus interface. Normal conus is see, This is one of the sign for a non for diagnosis of a dorsal lipoma. This is the interoperative photograph after laminectomy showing the neural defect through which the lipoma passes. And this is following opening of the dura. When one is able to see the, the, the subcutaneous mass, the pedicle lipoma, and the normal conus above and below the attachment of the lipoma. And as I said, the normal cord distal to the lipoma, as seen here, is the sign core norm for diagnosing a dorsal lipoma. And this is following exclusion of the lipoma. Now, this is another example of a dorsal lipoma and just to reiterate the point, the cord should be normal both dorsal as well as the proximal as well distal to the attachment of the lipoma. This, uh, the dorsal lipoma is actually a component of a type 2 split cord malformation. This patient had a type 2 split cord malformation with the lipoma being adherent to one of the hemicords and you can see the meningocyte monkey uh, there from, emanating from the hemicords. Now let's come to the next subtype, caudal lipoma with neural defect. This is a fairly difficult uh, subtype to operate. There is a big extra thecal lipoma here, which is which uh, goes through a bony and neural defect and is adherent to the caudal end of the cordus medullaris. And nerve roots often pass through the lipoma. The cord lipoma interface is at the terminal end of the cordus. And this is the neural defect. This is a bony defect through which the lipoma, the huge lipomatous mass is seen passing through. And after opening the dura, one sees the huge lipoma that is adherent to the conus and nerve roots will often be seen passing through the lipoma which makes the total excision of a lipoma sometimes difficult. Many caudal lipomas can be excised with radically but not every caudal lipoma because the nerve roots sometimes pass through the lipoma which leads to an incomplete and dazzling. This is another example of a caudal lipoma with dural defect. Let's come to the next entity, a dog transitional lipoma. This is a three-month-old child which, with a, the entire low back being swollen with a lipoma with a central dermal sinus leaking CSR. And this is the classical feature of a transitional lipoma. There's an extra thecal lipoma which passes through the bony defect, dural defect, and is adherent not only to the caudal aspect of the 
bonus medullaries, but also to the dorsal aspect of the bonus medullaries. And nerve roots may or may not pass through the lipoma, but one, if they pass through the lipoma, it makes the, the untethering difficult. And in this particular case, you can see the laminotomy has been done, the dermal sinus tract has been isolated, along with the lipoma has been isolated, and there's a, there's a huge mass of extra neural lipoma which was dissected. And we are able to see the neural tube and the defect in the dura through which the lipoma passes. And that is the site of this is the, the, the extra spinal lipoma which comes inside and is adherent to the, the lipoma conus interface is seen. The roots of the carda equina are seen. The lipoma conus interface was identified and a radical removal was done. This is following radical removal of the lesion. And this is the same child, 10 years post-op. The child has neurologically normal except for the radiologically she is developing mild scoliosis which is not evident much clinically. And this is a pre-op and 10 years post-op uh, T1 aided images showing no evidence of either retethering or uh, residual lipoma. The T2 images showing the total excision of the lipoma. Another example of a transitional lipoma, notice the extra thecal lipoma that passes inside and is adherent both to the caudal as well as the dorsal aspect of the conus metallaris. And this is the interoptic photograph which shows the huge lipoma adherent to the dorsal as well as the caudal aspect of the conus metallaris and the nerve roots are taking off ventral to the lipoma conus interface in this particular instance. And this is a close-up image of the same. And this is following excision of the lipoma. Notice the this is the lipoma conus interface from where the lipoma has been excised, and the nerve roots are taking up just parallel to the lipoma conus interface. And we have found, as I mentioned in one of the initial slides, we it is uh, we generally use 3D CC imaging for all these patients who for whom the MRI is done in our uh, institution because we find in not only in lipomas but all other forms of buccal spinal disc from 3D CC imaging provides an exquisite imaging of the pathological anatomy and with this particular patient with a huge transitional lipoma she was about six years old we found from 3D CC imaging showed us that the nerve roots were embedded in the lipoma and there is an exterior component of this is the thick and phylum terminal which is coming right up to the uh, uh, lipomatous mass in the subcutaneous region. So we gave a very guarded prognosis to the parents. The parents opted for surgery and as we expected, we found the nerve roots to be enmeshed in lipoma. We were not able to completely untether this patient. All we were able to do is to section the phylum terminal. So this is the 3D CC. What I am trying to emphasize is that 3D CC imaging gives an exquisite detail which should not be provided by other uh, modalities of MRI. Now, what is a lipomyelomanic acid? In fact, there are radiologists and uh, there are even sometimes other colleagues use the term lipomyelomanic acid synonymously for all spinal lipomas. It is, in, and in my opinion, it is wrong to do so because this term lipomyelomanic acid should be used only when the cord herniates extra spinally into the subcutaneous meningocele sac and is adherent to the lipoma in the wall of the sac. That is the only when this criteria is fulfilled, we have to use the term lipomyelomeningus. And this is the interrupted photograph of this particular patient shown in the previous slides. Notice the lipoma cord interface, as I mentioned in one of the initial slides, is outside the spinal canal and the nerve roots are passing inside and this is the open meningocele sac. Another example of a lipomyelomeningus where the, lipo, the lipoma cord interface is outside and the, look at the amount of gathering as a result of which the, 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 the nerve roots are not only thought that they are going upwards, they are causing upwards and laterally whereas normally they should be go, coursing downwards and laterally. And after detachment from the li lipoma, no, notice the lax nature of the cord and the normal uh, course of the nerve roots. This is another example, one of the patients operated about a year ago, a six months old female with no neurological deficit. Notice, this is the classical feature of a lipomyelomyosis. The cord should herniate outside into a meningocele sac and should be adherent to a lipomatous mass in the wall of the sac. If you take a section at this level, notice in the T2 images there is some series. So if you take a section, an axial section at this level, a T2 axial, this is the intraspinal portion of the 
spinal cord with the syrings and this is the extra spinal portion. This is the meningocele component of the lipomyelomeningocele and this is the cord is adherent to the serpiginous mass. Now this is the sequential intraoperative images, images which show the dissector delineating the defect, bony defect in the lamina through which the lipoma is entering inside the, inside the spinal canal. This is following a laminectomy. The, the, the meningocele sac is seen. This is cranial and this is caudal. One can see the, the structure, the cord herniating inside the lipomeningocele sac. And what we are able to see here is the phylum, which should also be identified and sectioned. The sequential steps showing the dissection of the lipomeningocele and the excision of the sac with the lipoma cord interface. And it is absolutely mandatory that in these cases we have to section the phylum terminal, otherwise the untethering procedure will be incomplete. Let's go to the next subtype, lipomyelocele, where the cord herniates extra spinally end in a subcutaneous lipoma. But then notice there is no herniation of the meninges, unlike the previous type, lipomyelomeningocele, where the the sub subarachnoid space and the meninges herniated outside. Here, the meninges and the subarachnoid space, they stop short at the bony canal. What herniates outside is the neural element, and this is the, the cord lipoma interface. And the MR minor clearly delineates that there is no herniation of the meninges or there is tracking of the CSF into the, the extra spinal component. And this is the Intra the photograph of the same patient. Notice the dura ends here. The dura ends here, and this is the lipoma, and this is the lipoma cord interface. And what comes out? So notice the, the nerve roots taking off ventrally from the lipoma cord interface and passing anteriorly. And the most important point I want the the viewers to remember is that the dura is deficient in this particular case as well. Generous duraplasty is often required and in our experience the maximum number of CSF leads pair in patients with lipomyelocytes. This is another example of a patient with a lipomyelomeningocyte with, where the lipoma cord interface is outside the canal. Another one of the much more recent patients notice this furrow in the in the back. And this is furrow, I mean she see in the subsequent images this furrow is the place where the cord was adherent to the skin which was pulling the skin inside. In fact this is the this is the sagittal T1 and D2. Notice there is no extension of the subarachnoid space outside. What goes outside is the cord which is adherent to the lipoma outside. And uh, this is uh, another image which clearly shows only the cord herniating outside and adherent to the subcutaneous lipoma. And these are the sequential intraoperative images which show the exposed to proximal lamina, one has to expose the proximal lamina because the normal dura should be identified and from that only one has to make the dural incision. And uh, here is, we are able to see the, the, the bony defect through which the cord has herniated. After a uh, laminectomy of the rostral lamina, the normal dura exposed to non, uh, proximal dura is seen and then the dura is open from the normal area towards the abnormal area. Notice the horizontal course of the nerve roots and, and the later slides you will see after untethering the nerve roots would have resumed the downwards and lateral course which means the cord is untethered. Now this is following untethering of the cord. Notice the chief difference between these two slides. This is the this is cranial, this is caudal. Notice the horizontal course of the nerve roots before untethering and the downwards and lateral lax course of the nervous after untethering. This is the extra spinal portion of the cord where the lipoma cord interface was there and this is the portion of the detached bonus before neurulation and this is following neurulation and this patient as all other patients with lipomyelosis they require a generous neuroplasty which should be watertight to prevent CSF leaks and pseudomeningosis. Now, what are the general surgical findings in patients with lipomas with dural defect? The subcutaneous lipoma generally communicated with the various variable size dural defect. The intraspinal lipoma size is variable. Certain cases it will be small, certain other cases it will be large. And then there are some recent studies which have shown that the chance of deterioration in patients with asymptomatic uh, lipomas 
is more if the intraspinal component, intradural component of the lipoma is more, and that has to be replicated in other studies. But next step is to identify the lipoma cord interface and uh, we excise the lipoma radically without neuroliting the cord until 2010. Whereas we started neuroliting the cord after 2010, after Spank's publication showed that neuroliting of the cord it decreases the, the chance of retethering. And generally, in this particular group, lipomas with neural defect, neuroplasty is frequently necessary. And this particular group, unlike the previous group where I showed there are practically no wound complications, the CSF leads were practically negligible. In this particular group, we had a uh, wound complications including half necrosis in 17 percent and there are 18 percent incidence of uh, uh, CSF leak and pseudomeningosis, most of which were treated conservatively. And uh, as far as complications are concerned, there are four patients who deteriorated. Uh, fortunately, no patient became paraplegic, but uh, root deficits were present in certain four, four of these patients. And late complications, 18 patients presented with re -tethering. Only 10 patients were willing for re redo surgery. And those patients who were reoperated for retethering, only the, 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 there is no significant improvement in six, and there is a partial improvement in four. And as I said, eight patients were not willing for redo surgery. Now, as far as the outcome is concerned, younger patients showed better improvement than older children, and improvement of more than one functional grade, Hoffman's grade, occurred only when the child was operated at a younger age. And obviously, when the child had a long-standing motor deficit and orthopedic abnormalities, those deficits did not improve. And of course, we do not expect orthopedic abnormalities to improve with this untethering surgery alone. Now, what are the general summarizing? What are the general differences between lipomas with and without dural defect? It, the lipomas with dural defect is due to a defect in the primary neurulation. It's a premature disjunction of the the neuroectoderm from the cutaneous ectoderm so that the mesenchyme comes inside and gets adherent to the developing neural tube before the neural folds close. Whereas in lipomas with a neural defect, it's a disorder of secondary neurulation. Generally, in lipomas with neural defect, because they have almost all of them have uh, cutaneous markers, they come to our attention, neurosurgical attention at a much younger age group. Whereas in this particular group without dural defect because the instance of cutaneous markers is less they come to uh, neurosurgical consultation at a later later age than the the other group with dural defect now as far as complications are concer concerned this the lipomas without dural defect because there is no basically Developmentally, there is no dural defect in this particular group. A primary watertight dural closure is possible, and hence the incidence of CSF leak is significantly less in this particular group. Whereas in this group with dural defect, a generous duroplasty is often required, and some of these patients also have a wide muscle gap, which makes a lot of dead space, and that is one of the reasons why there is a high instance of CSF leak in this particular group. And uh, because we were a little aggressive in removing the subcutaneous component of the lipoma, early in the series, we had a high incidence of flap necrosis, which has decreased in the recent years, mainly because we, have, we are leaving behind larger portions of the subcutaneous component of the lipoma. We, are, we fo focus more on the intraspinal component. And uh, because the nature of the pathology in this, in this group with dural defect, especially transitional lipomas and total lipomas is such that, that the risk of neurological deterioration is more. Whereas here, the, the caudal lipomas without dural defect and filar lipomas, it, they are simple straightforward cases and therefore the postoperative instance of postoperative deficit is less. Now, retethering is also common in this group because these are much more complex lesions where sometimes complete retethering cannot be done, and uh, that that is that is one reason why retethering occurs. Whereas here, retethering does not occur because these lesions can be excised totally, and as we can see, as we do know that the lower portion of the thecal sac is capacious, and when we excise these lesions totally, the chance of retethering is less. Now, concluding, spinal lipomas do not constitute the homogeneous entities as, as most of us tend to believe even now. And uh, as I mentioned in the initial slides, 
the term congenital spinal lipomatous malformation is preferred term rather than using a term like a lipomyelomeningocin or a lipomyelomeningocin lipoma and they can be broadly divided into two groups without dural defect and with dural defect and these two groups differ from one another in their embryology in the clinical presentation in the surgical strategy and the overall outcome and future studies should clearly define the radiological and surgical findings of congenital spinal lipomatous malformation so that appropriate comparison is made possible between different studies that will be all. Thank you. John? Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, well, well illustrated, well presented, and, and thank you for the effort of putting that presentation together. Uh, okay, we have Vanny Santosh here. Hello, Vanny. Hello. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, how are you doing? Uh, I don't know if you saw any yeah. presentation, but. Uh, uh, Simon, excuse me, uh, uh, we also yes. have uh, Bob. Uh, Simon, do you have any comments? Do you have any comments for, for the doctor? Uh, yes, How do we get back on screen, Simon? Yeah, you're still uh, screen sharing. Screen sharing. Get off the screen. Get off the screen. You're still screen sharing. Still screen sharing. Mm -hmm. Just click on the you arrow. On the arrow. Oh, screen screen sharing. Sharing. You just click on you the arrow on, on, on the left. There you okay. go. There you go. Or you get an be an expert at this. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Do you have a question, uh, uh, Uh Yes. Thank you. I, I heard most of the presentation, uh, and I think it was a very thorough uh, observation. Uh, there was so many things. You know, I just listened to it and and kind of broadened my knowledge of, of the topic. So I do not have any any things that are that are not you know that that I would need to further discuss after this presentation but uh, um, also I, I think this this whole conference this is a very nice addition to to the topics that that were added and, and always I'm always enjoying the pediatric neurosurgery topics which are presented so thank you very much for your presentation you know you know I have, I have a question or actually a comment in the United States a lot of orthopedic surgeons treat back problems. Is it the same in India or is it just neurosurgeons do that? Uh, as far as spinal lipomas are concerned, fortunately uh, most spinal lipomas in India are treated by neurosurgeons and occasionally a few lipomas might be treated by pediatric surgeons, general pediatric surgeons rather than pediatric neurosurgeons but the okay. But uh, they, they used to do it in large numbers earlier, but not so now. Now that they understand the complexity of the problem, most of these patients are now referred to neurosurgeons. Yeah, I, I guess when you're dealing with nerves, it's best to leave it to a neurosurgeon. Yeah. Very good. Okay, I appreciate your your talk and your efforts, and uh, uh, and you can hang around. We're going to start with uh, uh, Vanny's talk on neuropathology. Uh, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.